Welcome to the Mike on Much Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Veerman. I'm in the room with our pop culture aficionado, Shane Cunningham. And joining us from the road for the second episode in a row is our friend and trusted producer, Max Kerman. Max, where in the world are you at this moment? I'm in Amsterdam, the city of sin. Oh, <laughs> that's uh, you say that with such uh, sort of like a, a glee in your voice. Have you done anything sinful in Amsterdam? No, not yet, but I still have one more night, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, Shane and I actually uh, fought some street thugs in Amsterdam when we were there. I think we told that story on the podcast before. Oh, that was good. You had like a getaway cab driver, right? And then but, <laughs> yeah. but Shane was talking shit to the cab driver and the cab driver was like, I'm not going to drive. And they're like, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I was telling him to hurry up and I was kind of rude about it. And then he stopped the cab, but then the thugs were catching up while the cab was stopped. <laughs> and then I had to apologize so he would start moving again and we we got away by the skin of our teeth. Yeah. What's a trip to Europe if you're not going to get in a street fight with, uh, with randoms at four in the morning in the red light district? Exactly. But uh, yeah, hey, Shane, I was wondering so you were in Toronto at 8 a.m. just sipping a McDonald's coffee this morning? No, my, my bus, it's either, you know, I'll either get here at 9 or at 8. So I get, today, today the traffic was low. So what I do is I just walk extremely slow. <laughs> so then I can make whatever time I need. But wait a second. Get. Isn't that your pet peeve exactly? What? <laughs> Walking slow on a sidewalk? No, that, that's the thing people misconstrued. I don't care how fast you walk. Walk as slow as you want on the sidewalk. There's old people. There's, pe- there's people with children. It's the, um, I called it verticality, which was a stupid way to word it. It's, it's mostly not even lining up single file. It's just staying out of the way so people can pass. Everyone goes at a different speed. Okay. Make space. Make space so people can pass you and don't all walk up side by side by side, especially if you're in a group of five or more. But hey, walk your own speed. I will never chastise you. Shane, what is the state of your, your mental well-being with this commute? I think about you sometimes. I don't, I don't have the mental fortitude to do what you do. I would, I would just like literally quit my job or just do something different. Like I, I'm way softer than you are. How are you feeling having to wake up every morning at like 5 a.m. or whatever? Yeah, any time- just describe the com- <laughs> Shane, describe the commute a bit for our listeners just so they can get a feeling for what you go through. Well, it's about an extra 15 to 20 hours a week. So whatever you're working, add that to your week. So I was trying to think of creative ways to beat the commute. Like, uh, I'll read a book. I will take an online, I'll take a, ma- like I bought Masterclass. So I, it's like $275. I could like learn how to be as funny as Steve Martin uh, or something <laughs> like that. Uh, but How's that, that going, by the way? But uh, you, You're seeing it now. So how do you think? You're laughing. So uh, I, I started trying to do that, but I would fall asleep. Okay. So, that, so that wasn't working. And then uh, my data started getting out of control. And I was under the impression at work, since my work pays for my phone, we had unlimited data. And then I got like a $1,600 bill. Woo. And then uh, our accountant, Francesca, was quite mad at me and was considering cutting off my phone services. So I had to think of something else. So what I started doing is waking up 5 a.m., I do a workout for two hours, and then on the bus, I'm so exhausted, I sleep the entire time. Mm. I only sleep about four hours a night at in the home, and then I sleep three hours a day in the bus. So that works out actually to seven hours a day if you did the quick math. I know you're not good at math because you called an hour earlier today. But. <laughs> we haven't even discussed that yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm actually overall, I'm getting an hour more sleep than I used to get because I used to sleep six hours a day. So I, I've kind of figured it out. Do you have to play like mind games with yourself to be like, let's, it's like, let's find the good in this situation or like, let's find peace, even though the whole fucking situation sucks. Cause yeah, like, you know, when you hear about people that are in prison, like solitary confinement, they really have to like make it good in their mind. Is it kind of like that? You're, th- you're talking about like when they see us, right? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was thinking about the commute when I was watching uh, the chapter four in that, which is amazing by the way. And honestly, your plight is very comparable to those kids who were uh, wrongly charged and had to serve a very long prison term. Uh, yeah. It's very harrowing. Tomato, tomato. Commuting. It's true. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, it's apples and oranges. Like they, they're very similar. It's both fruits. They're both round. It's just a little bit different. Um, but uh, what I was gonna say is, it's the best part about it is, anytime I'm in an argument with my wife, I've always, I always have the edge. <laughs> so if she says something, I'm like, I'm commuting for the family. What are you doing? Kind of thing. You know? and she's like, I'm looking after the baby. I'm like, I wish I was looking after the baby. Like I love that baby. <laughs> It is a good trump card. And no, yeah, it's it's kind of uh, it's undefeated. Mm-hmm. I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, you're out here. You're you're earning the, the big bucks. Because moms are always complaining how hard it is with the baby, and I love hanging with the baby. It's I find so it so 
fun. I love I love changing the diaper. I love doing everything. So I'm sure it gets monotonous all the time. You didn't carry the baby though for nine months. You didn't have your body transform and have to do the breastfeeding and all that stuff. So she might actually have the ultimate trump card. Yeah, but she's she's pretty like she was made to give birth. Like her body like recovered like in a, a week. Like she's fine. <laughs> Um, okay, a couple things. So wait, are you doing all right with the commute though overall? Well, I've, I've mastered it now, but I would say it's a hellish existence. You uh, should get on master class on commuting. Yeah. People can learn how to commute like Shane Cunningham. Well, I just kind of I just kind of did it. There's not much more than that. You just told them actually. They just yeah. got it for free here on the podcast. Wait, wake up early and use the entire commute for sleep because I think that is the best use of your time. I want to talk to you about this uh, this phone bill. Was this recent? The 1600 phone bill? No, this was uh, right after Lucy was uh, born. Wow. And, but yeah, I was So like, how'd the talking to go? Was it like, we're going to cut your phone off? I was like, uh, I couldn't figure out what had happened. And then I realized, I, I sent them an email. I was like, hey, look, I got master class. I'm trying to uh, use my commute. And it kind of made me seem like a bit of a sweetheart. Like, oh, he's trying to learn. So they, exactly. gave, they gave me like a don't let this happen again. And I had to talk to Bell. Yeah, I'm watching the Steven Soderbergh one on directing, which will help my career. <laughs> exactly. So this is an investment by the company on the $1,600 bill. It was that vibe. That's the way to play it. And also, we work for Bell. I don't understand how you, we can charge ourselves and get in trouble for paying data, which is this made-up thing. This is where we <laughs> kick in with the music, and it's like technical difficulties have stopped the rest of this rant as we cut out the rest. Uh, yes, but before we get into other stuff, two things. Uh, one, I always forget to do this, but uh, this this episode of the Michael Much Podcast is brought to you by The Pedestal. Go and check out The Pedestal, our, 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 our uh, partner podcast with Shane, myself, and our friend Jonathan Popolis, uh, who, like we always like to say, is a member of Mensa. Every week on a Friday, we're going to come out with a new episode of The Pedestal on our feed, but all 20 of them are up over on The Pedestal feed. So go check it out. You'll get a new episode of The Pedestal this Friday. I uh, hope you enjoy it because this will be the last pod we're doing this week, Maxi. What is today? Tuesday. Uh, until I think you're back from Europe. Yeah, I come back on Sunday. So I'll see you guys uh, in less than a week. And speaking of Europe, uh, the plan this morning was like, let's record at 9.15. Max is excited. He's like, we're going to do this at 9.15. I'm like, great. I start getting a FaceTime call at 8.15. Uh, I'm feeding my baby literally in the, mini- like the, the middle of my morning routine. And Max is like, hey, what's up, guys? Ready to record? And it's like you almost saw immediately that I was at my apartment and I was not here at the office. And were you like... What's Mike doing? Or did you realize this was your bad immediately? Usually I assume if there's any fuck up, it's my fault. That's usually my starting place. (laughs) So I was like, oh yeah, that totally makes sense that that'd be the kind of thing that I like uh, screwed up. Uh, But I did swear in front of your baby immediately. And I was wondering, what what are your thoughts on that? that? Should I not do that? I said, fuck. Well, you did. So like, I, I then sh- turned the FaceTime over so you could see Winona. And you went, ah, fuck. And then literally Danica was standing behind me. And she just looks at me. And I was like, OK, Max. Well, we'll call you when I get to the office, buddy. Uh, but uh, our philosophy is I've I've been swearing, uh, or I had when the baby was first around. And Danica, who isn't precious or anything, was like, eh, maybe we're like, let's not swear so much around the baby. I'm like, the baby doesn't know what we're saying. She's like, I don't know. It feels like poison in the air. And I, that made me laugh so hard. But I was like, you know what? I respect it. And there's at some point we're going to have to curb not that we're walking around like truckers like dropping f-bombs every second word but uh yeah anyway so we 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 try not to in her company but if something slips you know so you know you just want to keep it nice and light around the kid uh so when uncle max calls in uh on the old facetime and starts dropping the f-bomb i thought the c word was a little excessive oh, come on you know? <laughs> i'm just kidding you didn't say that what do you and uh, alex do with swearing yeah lucy will only hear it if we're having an argument and i'm like that fucking commute <laughs> is killing me you know for no i'm kidding um um, Commute is a bad word in your house, yeah, actually. No. That's the C word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we've realized Lucy picks stuff up now. Like, she'll say the odd word. Like, um, I call Alex probably three or four times a day. And Alex obviously says hello when she answers the, the phone. So Lucy now will pick up her toys and randomly put it to her ear and go, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that's, that's her new move. So if the so if the swearing starts, you know, yeah, like, they'll pick it up. Yeah, that's the thing. You don't want to be like the parent that has the kid in daycare that's like dropping f bombs. So it's like you got You got to shut it down at some point. So so you screwed up the timing because you're in Amsterdam. Uh, what have you been doing? Yeah, it's been good. Yeah. Lauren just went home. Uh, she, her vacation that kind of was melded into this tour uh, was really fun. Though speaking of arguments with. Uh, with girlfriends. Uh, last night we were going for a walk to dinner with uh, Nick and Mike and Lauren. And Lauren and I are both fully aware that we get very unreasonable when we're hungry. 
Um, and we realized that this walk was going to be about an hour and 20 minutes to walk to this uh, dinner reservation that we had. Oh. Yeah. And so I said to Lauren on the way, uh, I said, hey, maybe I should run to this convenience store and get a bag of chips for us just to eat on the walk, just to hold us over. And she's like, yes, I, I need that. Bring it. And then I went into the store, but we've also been talking a lot about how we've been eating pretty unhealthily on this uh, trip. And um, so I went into the store and I got... Uh, two bananas and some like nuts, some like very like unsalted nuts. So I bring it back out thinking that I'll be rewarded as being a healthful boyfriend who's encouraging good eating habits. And then she just like looks at me in disgust and she's like, I thought you said you were getting chips. And I was like, well, I thought, I thought you were doing, I thought we were doing this for like healthy reasons here. She's like, oh, and then she kind of like grabs a couple of the, you know, cashews and then eats a few and her banana looked good from the outside, but then was bruised on the inside. So she uh. threw it in the trash. And then, and then I said like, and then she said, you know, there's more calories in these nuts than there would have been in a bag of chips. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And then she just gives me the finger and walks away. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I think that is true about cashews, yeah, though. Yeah. By, by the way, for our listeners, well, it's Lauren healthy. Is one of those right. It's good fat. Ever, and we were both hyper aware that it, we just become maniacs when we're hungry. So I, I didn't really, it didn't really bother me yeah. too much. And then um, at dinner, she was checking her flight information. We thought we both thought she was leaving on Wednesday. She happened to check her flight. Turns out it was today. It was Tuesday. So. If she, if she had not checked her phone, we would have been having a day in Amsterdam and then realized like later tonight when she was going to check in, I put that in quotes, to the flight on Wednesday that we had missed the flight. So we were like, oh, man, we really dodged a bullet. But then she saw how much money I paid for the, her flight and basically I've been paying for everything on this trip. So she's like, man, I, it's pretty amazing that you're putting up with me at this point. I just unironically gave you the middle finger in the middle of the streets of Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> So it's kind of a win that she checked that of the flight and those prices. It's, you know, it's kind of like it's almost like the commute thing. Yeah, it's, it's almost cart. like yeah, it's the <laughs> truck cart. Yeah. So, uh, but we've had a great time. We were in Berlin, and um, the, Lauren loves Berlin. She's been there twice with her friend Laura, and her sister Maddie uh, lives in Berlin. She's doing a grad school program there. And Lauren, um, who's, who's a pretty like straight and narrow kind of person, and usually spends all of her time studying. She is sort of interested in, in like the club scene in, in Berlin because Maddie, her younger sister, has told her all about like the techno scene, and she's been a couple times, and she's really enjoyed it. So, uh, so she wanted to go to this like kind of famous, really hipster, cool techno bar on Friday in Berlin, and asked if I'd go with her. And I'm kind of, I like to party, but like, tech, the techno scene isn't really what you think of when you think of me, right, guys? No, no. Okay, have you guys ever been to a techno bar? No, I never have. No, like, well, like, well, like, like, describe a techno bar. Like, what would even be a techno? Bar? What did you think it was before you went? Like a German techno like, bar. Like, you have to do ecstasy to get in, right? <laughs> That's at the door. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll walk you through this thing. So, so, like, do people dress different? Are you talking like a rave? Is yeah, it like, like kind of like a modern yeah. rave? Glow sticks. Glow sticks. Oh, glow sticks. Uh, not quite, but um, so Lauren basically. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. There's almost the glow stick yeah, there. Pensive. Almost. Like, yeah. What kind? Oh, yeah. What's close to that? <laughs> well, I'll, I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. Um, right. So Lauren basically says to me, she's like, "All right, Max. Like the thing what Maddie has told me about these bar, th these techno clubs, is that." Like, it is up to the bouncer's discretion if they're going to let you in. You could be waiting in line for two hours, and if the bouncer just looks at you and doesn't like the cut of your jib, he can just go, not tonight, and then you just have to leave. That's the way it goes, right? It's like Club 54 used to be. Yeah, exactly. Or daycare. Or, yeah. <laughs> That's a joke for all the parents out there. <laughs> I'm currently doing daycare tours. But yes, they're an ultimate gatekeeper. Yeah. You're at their mercy, no matter how cool or rich you are. Exactly. So Lauren says to me, like, Max, you can't wear your flowery shirt, all right? No one's wearing that shit at the club. <laughs> <laughs> what, you only have one flowery shirt? <laughs> no, but I have, like, many flowery shirts. Oh, okay, yeah. The eight things you pack, you can only wear one of them. I have one black shirt. I Let me guess. Your wardrobe is five flowery shirts, two Raptors championship gear shirts, and then like a black t-shirt. That's exactly what my wardrobe is. You nailed it. I'm not kidding. You. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. So then she's like, okay. I'm like, okay, no problem. I'll play the part. All good. Um, and then w the, the bar was like a, probably an hour and a half away in the sort of secluded part of Berlin, not right downtown. 
And I was like, let's walk because it, it was a beautiful night. It was a Friday night, and we'll get to see a bunch of neighborhoods. And the club doesn't open until midnight anyway, so we have some time. So on the walk, she's like, okay, here are the things you need to know in case the bouncer asks because they'll ask you because they want to make sure that you're not a fucking tourist, that, that you're here for the right reasons. So number one, there's like – there's here's a list of DJs that are playing for the whole weekend. And by the way, once you get into this bar, you can stay for like 72 hours. That's how long this party goes. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So she's like, remember a, D- a DJ name. And um, the, fir- the one that was playing at midnight when we were going to get there was named Tom Tallenberg. I was like, all right, Tom Tallenberg. Who are we here to see? Tom Tallenberg. Tom Tallenberg. And then she's like, what's the name of this party like that we're going to? I was like, it's called Synoid Weekender. And I'm like, Synoid Weekender, Synoid Weekender. And then I'm like, what kind of music is it? I was like, techno. So the whole walk, she's kind of like quizzing me. I'm like, okay, who are we here to see? What's the party called? What kind of music? And so I'm like kind of getting in my mind. I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, we get to this kind of warehouse and there's like this long kind of uh, abandoned road, which a bunch of young people are kind of coming upon it. Kind of feels like a pilgrimage, to be honest, because even though everybody's probably a little drunk on a Friday night, nobody's making a sound because everybody knows that if the bouncer doesn't like you and you're being like loud and touristy, you're not going to be let in. So everybody's like pretty cool and quiet. So I'm like, oh, this is this is kind of like living up to what Lauren has said about these parties. So, so we get into line. And the people we happen to be standing behind are these really loud, rambunctious, like, 20-year-olds that are clearly, like, on an S-trip. Like, you know, like, like traveling around Europe. And they're breaking the mold oh, yeah. of what everybody else is doing in line. So there are these two girls that are from Australia that are really being loud. And there are these, like, five boys from France. They're all these beautiful young French boys. They, they, they can't grow any facial hair or anything. But they're, like, young, 20 <laughs> years old. And they're just being like, loud and obnoxious. And, we're, and Lauren's kind of like, because Lauren's an uptight person. She's like, I hope they don't think we're with them. This is this is not good. I don't like being so close to these people. And so and so, you know, and I had to like go to the bathroom. But there's probably like 200 people in line before ahead of us. It was like a lot of people. And uh, Lauren uh, goes. I, and by the way, there's still 200 people there in front of us. I say, hey, Lauren, I'm just gonna like run over there to that bush and take a piss because I have to go bad. She's like, okay, but if I get to the front of the line uh, and you're not back, uh, I'm going in without you. I'm like, Lauren. There's 200 people ahead of us. It's going to take 30 seconds to take a piss. Don't worry about it. So anyway, Lauren's sort of like getting concerned. Um, the So we get towards the front of the line. And as we're and, – and we're thinking though like these people clearly don't know etiquette for a rave. They're just being completely the opposite. I like that Max is like these people. Yeah, you were being quizzed on the way over 10 minutes before you're <laughs> – I can't believe these newbies don't know the etiquette for a rave line. Oh, I'm so put off by these young French boys. They need to know how to act. Okay, anyway, go on. So but anyway, so then we're overhearing their conversation and the Australian girl starts going – Tom Tallenberg, Tom Tallenberg, Tom Tallenberg. I'm like, fuck, she knows Tom Tallenberg too. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. Um, meanwhile, we're seeing these people that had been uh, at in front of us having been turned around and walking away from the club. So it's like, oh fuck, this guy, these, these bastards are serious. They're turning people away. Um, we end up, uh, as we get a little closer, these two uh, kids behind us, these two guys, uh, kind of uh, offer us a bit of their drink and uh, they start making conversation with us. One is a local uh, from Berlin named Felix, because all German guys are named Felix, as we know. Um, yeah. And uh, the other guy's a kid named Luca. And Felix and Luca know each other from school in Amsterdam, uh, but they're in Berlin to go to this rave. And Lauren's like, so are you guys going to party pretty hard tonight? She, and they're like, no, we're, we're going to take it easy tonight, because tomorrow we're going to the sex party at this other bar. I was like, wow, like these guys, this Berlin's, you know, it's for... All the freaks out there. It sounds like a you know pretty wild time, um, and they're like, and then the guy goes to me. They're both, but they're both very friendly guys. Both, um, and the, he's like, "How old are you?" He asked me, and I'm like, uh, "I'm 32." Like, "How old are you?" They're like, "18." <laughs> I was like, "These guys oh my God. <laughs> are so young." And then they're like, what do you guys, what do you do? And Lauren's like, oh, I just finished nursing school. I'm like, oh, like, I play music. And they're like, oh, and their eyes like, sort of, they perk up, like, what kind of music? I'm like, oh, we're like, I'm in a rock and roll band. 
and they go, oh, huh. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't they weren't rude about it, but I could just see that they were. I really felt like a dinosaur, you know that, like like yeah. these these young kids that are going to sex parties and going to techno clubs. They just like they look at rock and roll as if I'm the grandpa kind of thing. Yeah. You know? So anyway, um, oh, also another thing that happens is they pass back this sheet um, of paper with these little green dots on them. And so I started thinking, like, are they just... What were they, Max? (laughs) No. Get this. I don't know, like, no, but it was throughout the whole line. So I was like, are they just handing out, like, ecstasy or whatever, like, right now? Like, I've never taken ecstasy. I don't know what it looks like. And um, it turns out that it wasn't a drug. It was a sticker to go over the lens of your camera phone because uh, that is strictly prohibited at the bar. So you basically cannot pull out your camera at all to use it. So I was like, ah, oh, that's an interesting move. Did you ever hear anything like that before? Just, no. just when they put, like at comedy shows, they'll put your phones in a sack. But the sticker over the phone, I guess, is a cheaper way to do that. Yeah, cheaper way to do it. So anyway, we get to the front of the line, and uh, just as we get there, the, the crowd of uh, Aussies and French kids that are ahead of us all get turned away and it felt so fucking great to be like see you don't know what the real scene is like you're a poser you're a <laughs> not like me um and, yeah i don't know the bouncer just didn't like the cut of the jib and then they just sort of had to solemnly walk away their spirits were broken uh then lauren and i get to the front uh that no questions asked they wave us right in because they know Whoa. what is real. And then, of course, our two, uh, our two buddies behind us, uh, Luca and Felix, immediately got in, too. Uh, it, 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 also, it was really funny to see the people that had line bypass uh, because they really looked like out of an SNL skit about what German ravers look like. <laughs> I'm not kidding. There'd be, like, <laughs> five of them walking in tandem, but, like, wearing, like, the craziest, like, big, like, like boots and, like, weird see-through stuff and collars. It, it was really, like, a hell of a scene in there. Did you have to show your ID? Uh, I think so, yeah, yeah. Because isn't that a tip-off that you're a tourist, though, if you have an Ontario license? See, the thing which Luca, uh, sorry, uh, Felix was describing is that it's not about whether you're from Berlin or not. It's whether you get the spirit of the city. And if you're right. some, like, loud tourist that is just getting, like, fucked up and, like, clearly, like, is just there to party in the wrong way, they don't want you. But if you're... Doing- you need to be a part of the scene and not just a spectator to watch the freaks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um... So I was also thinking it would be funny, though, if we were there with the nut and the nut tried to get to the front of the line and how that would go. <laughs> do, you think, do, you, do you think the nut would have got in uh, based on the criteria you've set out from this German bouncer? Um, he would have to dress a little different. You know when he wears his, like, his baseball hat and you know, his Supreme stuff? And, yeah, and I don't think his negotiating skills with bouncers in Berlin would really work in the same way they do in North America. You know what I mean? Um, but anyway. Uh, we got into the bar. It like it was like totally dark and smoky. There's two dance floors. There's like an outdoor kind of patio area for you to hang out. Um, it was kind of cool. That was an interesting experience in that like everybody's sort of like dancing sort of by themselves. All the dudes like the Champagne Boys, I might add, take their shirts off like by like the 30 minute mark, and everybody's just kind of dancing by themselves with their shirts <laughs> off. And there's a DJ. There's no melodies whatsoever. It's just pumping, throbbing beats. And um, one of the one of the boys, uh, Luca, uh, went up to Lauren and said, uh, "Have you seen any uh, any hot guys for me? Uh, you know, you see any any cute cute guys for me?" And Lauren's like, "Look around! Like, there seems to be like lots of cute gay boys here for you." And then uh, he said, "This is the most hetero party I've ever been to," which wow. <laughs> which to me is maybe the gayest party I've ever been to. Uh, but what do I know? Um, but it was cool, um, and uh, yeah, I didn't stay. Like, I probably got out there like three thirty, four in the morning. And uh, wait, so you didn't you didn't do the seventy two hours? I did not do the. No, we had to play a wedding that next night, so I had to like kind of behave. Yeah, what was the deal with that? I saw that on Instagram. Uh, you had like a story or something up. Didn't you? Oh, yeah, like, there's some friends in Berlin uh, that, that are bigger Kells fans, and they saw that we were playing this festival on the Sunday and asked if we'd come play the wedding on the, on the Saturday. So we just did it. It was really fun. How long is a set at a wedding? Uh, we, I think we played for like 45 minutes or something. It can be anything, okay. really. But back to the, the techno bar. Um, 
Lauren, you know, especially after talking her, to her sister about it, she says, like, the reason why the experience is particularly enjoyable is that unlike a lot of other bars, it feels like a very um, safe space, actually, even though I'm sure people are, are doing drugs and it's like there's that, a darkness to it. Um, in, in the sense that there's like there's not guys like kind of creepily hitting on girls all the time and everybody seems to be on the same level nobody has their phone out which I thought was actually really interesting because you know whenever you go to a bar now everybody's either looking at their phone or texting somebody or filming something that does not seem to exist in that scene so then so she's like yeah in terms of an like, experience of going out it's actually really nice and then I, I started thinking about the various scenes that are out there and I think like there's always like a bit of a theatrical performance to whether you're going to a rave or whether you're partying on a boat in Miami or whether you're hanging in a pub whatever it is there's an artifice to it but I was thinking about like what is the happiness and index for different uh, if you were to compare different party cultures and which people kind of get the most like deep joy and happiness out of Party because I can understand that there's a different personality types that are attracted to a, a particular scene, but I was wondering, like, you know how they do the happiness index for countries, like which country like feels the most like, sure. sort of deeply satisfied. I was like, oh, I wonder what party scene has the it has the greatest happiness index, and, and and then the least happiness index. Like, do people are people in L.A. super miserable because they have to live that quote unquote L.A. lifestyle, or are people in Berlin like more liberated because? they can let their freak flag fly like I don't know uh, I wonder if you guys have any thoughts on that it's an interesting question for sure like uh, you're talking about like the performative nature of yeah it's like people go like the whole point of going out and being amongst friends and commiserating and sort of like having a sense of community is because it, it brings joy you're partying right mm -hmm. and it's like there are people you hear all the time they're like oh I'm miserable I go to the bar and I'm miserable That's or it's saying. like I'm out yeah. here but I'm not having a good time so yeah that, that, that is an interesting question like yeah I don't know like I'm very happy at a pub <laughs> like talking about movies or trying to solve the world's problems you know futilely as uh, over pints i i don't know if i'd be happy at a techno rave. i'm certainly not happy at like a club like a mm -hmm, mm -hmm, club like that whole scene but i don't if, know if, if there was no drugs allowed at these techno parties would they be as happy great question yeah that's a good question too yeah because that's definitely part of it and i think age factors into it too i think if you're like 50 you're going to be very unhappy if you're still going to a techno club <laughs> but if you're 18 and you have a sex party the next night you're doing ecstasy and like, <laughs> life feels pretty good i would think yeah that, that those are actually great counters to like your happiness index uh on the party scene max is uh, age plus substance you're using to enhance your experience yeah yeah, and again, like I think a lot of it's specific to the like the kind of thing. Like I had an enjoyable time at this rave, and like, did you do ecstasy or not, Max? No, I did. No, I did. I, I certainly did not. I did not. Anyway, that that was my experience. Uh, shouts to Luca and Felix uh, for being uh, sweet guys, offering me a, a sip of their. Uh, their vodka in, in line. Nice boys. Yeah. So, so would you recommend a, a, a techno rave? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, that's sort of the, the idea. Yeah. When in Rome, it's like, it was kind of one of those things. It was like, I'm here. I'm in Berlin. Also, it's funny, even though saying 32 felt kind of old, I was, I don't really feel 32. Do you guys feel your age? How old do you feel? To me, I always feel like I'm 19, no matter what. Uh, well, the other day I, I was doing a shoot and the sound guy, he was talking about just a 27 year old crew guy. He's like, do you know this guy? He's 27. So he's like much, much younger than us. And he, <laughs> and he kind of like hit me in the gut and I'm like, you're like 46. Do you think I'm 46? <laughs> I'm like, I'm closer to him than you. Like, do I look very, very old? And I just felt super old. And I was like, Ah, yeah, us guys, you know, old. <laughs> Is that what you said? No, but that's uh, my mentally. I felt like yeah. I, di I didn't want to be offended because that would offend him. But yeah. I felt it very hurtful. So, okay. But but aside from that insulting uh, encounter, do you feel younger than your age? Well, I've, I've been feeling my age lately. Hmm. Certainly when, once you have a kid, you you have a whole different like way you feel. Like I feel like a responsible adult in a way I never had before. That's true. But I think that I think everybody, I think universally, people tend to feel like I think I don't know if you, you if you get mentally stuck, but I think basically it's like you sort of you age and evolve to a point, whatever that is, say it's like 28, something like that. And then in your brain, you're kind of like, oh, I'm I'm kind of like my form. I in my mind's eye, I'm an adult the way that I see myself in a certain age pocket, which is probably from like 27 to 40 or whatever it is but then you age past that like I'm, I'll never forget talking to my dad or I took a photo of my dad and my brother and me and I've told the story in the pod before and I showed him it was on Instagram and it was the three of us and my dad was like oh geez I'm like what 
And he's like, I didn't know I looked like that. I was like, what did you think you looked like? And he pointed at me and he goes, I thought I looked like that. And so it's like this funny thing where where it's like you 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 get older, but you imagine yourself at whatever. You know what I mean? Like I, I think in your brain, you see yourself more youthful. I think everybody does. You know, like when, you, when you're like 19 or 20, you're like, what am I going to be like when I'm 25 or 26? And then you get to 25 or 26. And it's essentially kind of the same physically, I think, for some people uh, for the next kind of decade. So then your brain just kind of stays in that pocket and it shifts depending on who you're with. If you're with a bunch of 19 year olds going into a rave, you're going to feel old. But if you're hanging out with a bunch of like, you know, people, you know, Max, if you're in the the Maple Leaf uh, Sports Entertainment Lounge talking to the guy that owns Cineplex, you're going to feel really young. If you're hanging out with Rob Babcock, you're going to feel very young. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I will say this, though. Um, I feel like when I look at younger people, I personally, like whether it's a a boy or a girl, uh, like they don't seem that young to me. Um, Like I'm like, oh, I'm a peer. But then Lauren will be like, oh, those boys look so young. They look like they're like 19. I'm like, oh, I thought I looked like that. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like those French (laughs) boys. I was like, oh, yeah, they do look young. (laughs) But but for me, it's more like a state of mind than even how you look. Like I found when I was was young, I always felt like a – like neurotic 30 year old hmm. like i remember i was i was six years old and i was very scared to go to grade one so i called my mom in my room before uh, bed and i was like mom i don't think i'm ever gonna get, get a job i don't think i'm ever going to have a girlfriend or learn how to drive a car and my mom goes yes you will you will everyone gets through those things and then i never had a girlfriend all of high school i never learned how to drive a car and i barely got a job <laughs> <laughs> like I just got lucky and won a contest, so it was like a prophecy that I like uh, fulfilled myself. <laughs> but like, I always had those adult worries when I was a kid, and I was it was always on my mind, and I always had terrible anxiety, like uh, that aren't typical worries of a kid. So I've always felt older, like mentally, rather than worried about how young I look. You know? Yeah, totally. And as as you've gotten older, do you start to feel younger mentally, or do you feel like you're just catching the same? Up? I always I've always felt the same. Right. But when that guy took, commented on my looks, I was like, holy shit. Like, people don't ever go, Shane, you look so young. Right. Like, no, whereas that happens to you all the time. Yeah, so yeah. I'm always with you. Like, how old are you? Like, 20? <laughs> and I'm like, how old do you think I am? They're like, oh, you're like 36. I'm like, yeah, 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 I am. <laughs> <laughs> Max, will you, uh, do you find that you can keep up with the Felixes and the Lucas of the world? I think so. Yeah. I know. I mean, yeah, I, th- I think I, I, I like I uh, I've always taken some pride in being able to make conversation with anybody at any age. Like even even when I was a kid, I could like make conversation with like adults, people my age, younger. So, yeah, I think like hanging with with people that are a little younger or older has never bothered me. But I, yeah, I just always feel like I'm 19. I think. All right. What's our next topic as we move on here? We're just we're breezing through this. Yeah. So my question for you guys, uh, do we want to talk about the Cats trailer or do we want to talk about the Z special? <laughs> do we want to talk Aziz or do we want to talk this incredibly bizarre Cats trailer starring Taylor Swift and James Corden and others? Shane, your call. Well, let's let's leave it to a vote. Like what here on because like, I know what I want. I'd prefer to talk. About. Oh, I don't have a preference. So then okay, if, if you if either of you have a strong preference, and I'm what do you have a preference for, Max? On the count of three, let's say it. Okay, one, two, three. Aziz. Aziz. <laughs> <laughs> Can't help but feel you just copied me, Max. <laughs> There's a slight delay. So. No, this is no, I think okay because with the cats thing, I don't know. It seems like the internet has roasted the cats trailer a lot. There's not much more to say about it. And here, here's a, a hot take from old Chaney boy. I didn't think it was that bad. There you go. Like I wasn't like laughing at it or anything, and I could see definitely how people put it out and thought, hey, the people are gonna love it. I okay. Well, we'll do this for like two minutes. Like. I definitely laughed at it, but I think it's no different than the fucking the Broadway play. Like, like, yeah, it's obviously it's it's some, it's a taste thing. You're either into it and you accept the reality of these humanoid cats living in these gigantic sets and doing cat like things. And if you and by the way, I'm a cat person. I own two cats. I love cats. Uh, but you you'd have to be into the play. It just seems like they've filmed a version of the the, the, the Broadway. Play. I was much more freaked out when the Willy Wonka trailer with Johnny Depp came out a few years right. ago when right. he was just so weird and it was just like. I'm not sleeping tonight. <laughs> like it was very. I'm not. Do you do you know that movie, uh, Max? Willy Wonka. The Tim Burton yeah, one. Yeah, it's the remake. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, but but anyway, I, I did laugh. Like the trailer did make me laugh, just in the sense that it's like, wow, they're really going for it. I think when anybody earnestly commits to something like that, and I know it's supposed to be a little bit campy, 
it, it just it looked bizarre, but they're taking it seriously and they're you know they're vamping it up. Uh, yeah, like it made me giggle. Like I, I you know I'm not it's not I won't be first in line to see it, but if it comes on the movie network at some point, uh, I'm sure I'll stick around for 20 minutes. So that's the subject we're not talking about. <laughs> What's the one? Wait, we wait, are? wait, 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 wait. Did you laugh at the cast trailer, Max? I did laugh, but I also kind of sided with you, uh, Mike, in that. It, the whole premise is so ridiculous, and if they're gonna like do a non like cartoon version of it, and they're gonna try to get like real humans involved, then it's gonna look, kind of look a little strange. The decision to like whether or not to give uh, the cats breasts or not, which that's the one that kind of make make, make me giggle. What, do they have uh, breasts? Well, and, and I didn't look at it that. They close. gave the male cats huge dongs. Did you see James <laughs> Corden when he was dancing? His dinky was flopping around everywhere. Well, that, that was his tail, wasn't it? Oh my bad, it was his tail. Oh, yeah. I miss <laughs> I miss saw that. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Last thing about cats, even though this is the subject, like Shane said, we're not talking about. What do you think of Taylor Swift uh, jumping into the old acting scene? And I know it's like a singy, acty performance, but what do you think of Taylor Swift as an actress? I feel like she is under so much scrutiny uh, for everything she does that to choose this kind of role, uh, a movie that is so... Uh, divisive or people like to mock. I think she's kind of asking for it. I wonder, like, what do you guys think would be the ideal role for her as an introductory move to the to the acting scene? Because I just think this one... Because I don't think she's done any other acting, has she? Or maybe a small part in another movie? Well, just in her music videos. So. Yeah. SNL. But yeah. I was going to say playing a kitty would be a good role for her, which <laughs> she is doing. And, and this is directed by Tom Hopper, who directed King's Speech. She so has really been defending the shit out of this movie. <laughs> I got a feeling like you're going to be there on opening night. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what would be ideal for her. I mean, Harry Styles made a good transition uh, by sort of picking a really small, small, small role in a prestige film by Christopher Nolan. He was in, Shane, I'm blanking on the name of that film, uh, World War uh, One or two. Oh, two uh, I won a bunch of Oscars. Anyway, Dunkirk. Dunkirk uh, yeah. So Harry Styles sort of did that, and then now apparently he's uh, he, he was in the running for, um, they're looking at casting him as the lead in The Little Mermaid. Oh, crazy. Yeah, I just think that Cats is just like a weird one. Like, if, if I were her, I would have done the Harry Styles thing, where it's like, find a smaller role in a really prestige a movie with like but Tom Hanks. But is this Hanks not a smaller role? This is a small role. It I is, think. and this is an Oscar caliber director. But the but the premise is so goofy. All right. Yeah. Moving on from Cats, uh, Aziz Ansari came out with a uh, new special. Does anyone remember the title of it? Uh, right now. Right now, uh, directed by Spike Jones, uh, who's obviously a very uh, uh, idiosyncratic director. He's got a, a, a unique style. Uh, he's prestigious. So it's interesting that Spike was going to do this with Aziz, and the reason that it's interesting that Aziz did this is this is the first special since uh, the uh, allegations of sexual misconduct uh, were levied against him, um, which I think we've discussed slightly on this pod maybe last year. I can't quite recall. But um, yeah, so this is his step back into the public eye uh, in sort of a very visible way on Netflix with this special directed by Spike Jones. So uh, you guys have both seen the whole thing? Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I, so I saw the first 30 minutes. I didn't turn it off because I was like, you know, out of outrage and thing. I just, I just, I had to go and do something and then by the time I came back, I, I was, I was time to go to bed. So I just haven't finished it. But my thoughts were sort of, before we get to sort of the content, I thought aesthetically it looked really cool, which is more of a Spike Jones thing, I think, than a Aziz Ansari thing. I thought like the way that it opened where he follows him on the street, they have the track playing and then they go into the theater and the theater's completely ripped out. So he basically goes in a side stage door into this theater and he can see the crowd from the stage door the way it opens. Now, I, I started thinking, wow, what a crazy theater that you could go in the side door and see the audience and then I was like oh what they did was they ripped out all the sets so in most theaters right you have like a very deep stage and you can put like a layer like four or five layers of sets that will slide in and out for any sort of play whatnot they ripped everything out so literally it was just like a giant and deep stage it was a really cool way to shoot it um, that I, I, I imagine Spike Jones deserves credit for maybe Aziz as well uh, and then also visually just kind of had like a cool like 16 millimeter look I don't know if they shot it on film or if they, they applied effect later but I just I like the way it looked I thought I it was think cool. they did shoot it on film it looked cool yeah. do you guys agree with that yeah yeah I love the way it opened I think that's like one of the tricks when it comes to comedy specials is how do you give it a unique look and feel and like you know sometimes a big comedian will do a tiny room or they'll do it in a yeah. unique city or there'll be some because that's really like the moment where you kind of separate yourself in terms of the aesthetic and I loved the song they used uh, it was a Lou Reed song which they opened and closed with uh, Mike they used the same song at the end and I think this the, the whole tone of, of Aziz's set was sort of understated and that song I think was perfect 
Uh, and I know Spike Jones is obviously a very acclaimed director, but I, you should give Aziz a little bit of credit because I think that was one of the reasons why people loved his show Master of None so much, is that you can sure. tell he's a real student of directing, and I'm sure that that whole idea was based on various references from the past that he really liked. Uh, so, I, yeah, I thought um, it had this really unique and memorable feel and look to it that separates it from a lot of other specials. How do we feel about the Metallica shirt he wore? I kind of liked it. It didn't bother me. I think it was, yeah. for some reason, because Aziz Ansari is like an Indian-American him wearing a Metallica shirt just felt kind of cool. If it was like a white dude doing it, maybe I'd think differently. I don't know. If that's just where my mind mm-hmm. my went. As like someone that watches like, uh, you know, obviously Shane and I work in television, so you sort of know how they, uh, the sausage is made. But I always think of things in like fascinating ways where it's like you have to wear an outfit that you're going to have to wear for like four nights in a row because they shoot about, they shoot four of those, right? And then yeah. they're going to, you know, there was, an, there was an ISO cam. There's like a camera on stage that's really tight on his face that they would cut to sometimes. Obviously, in like the seven wide shots they use, you never see that camera. So I was wondering if he ran the whole routine hmm. once with the camera and no audience or if they right. ran it with, with an audience and a camera just on stage. And so I was thinking a lot about sort of how they built the, 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 the sort of the, the filming mechanism. So I'm like, the Metallica shirt, the, I think it was blue jeans or black pants. And I was like, he has to wear an outfit that obviously doesn't look like it changes much over four nights or whatever. Mm-hmm. So that's one. Two, there's a point where he calls out a woman in the crowd. Uh, I can't remember the bit. But it's like, if you watch every time they show the front row, it changes a, a million times, right? So yeah. it's like, you realize, but this happens every, this happened with the Chappelle special, all that stuff. Stuff. Uh, but anyway, so when you mentioned the Metallica shirt, that's what I thought about. I'm like, they just needed sort of an identifiable shirt, or at least a shirt that he could wear four nights in a row that you wouldn't think anything different. It, it doesn't mess but with But do you. you think he's an actual Metallica fan, or just poser because it looks cool? Yeah, I think it was just as a joke, like an ironically worn shirt. Right. Like, the, it'd be the least thing, it'd be the last thing you think Aziz would wear sort of deal? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. So, I mean, obviously, the, 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 I guess the thing that people would want us to, to, to talk about and something that should be addressed is, I guess, and, and Max, why were you just bringing this up? Was it to discuss just the merit of the comedy? Was it the idea of him making a comeback after such a, a publicly sort of like, um, uh, I, I don't know what the word is, but like... Fall I, from grace? Fall from grace, yeah. Yeah, well, I think the reason why I was interested in it is, is actually, you brought it up on a pod uh, months ago when this happened, Mike, was that you said that... Uh, when he started to do shows again, uh, he was called out for sort of um, playing the victim card a little bit and complaining about politically correct culture. And I think there was a pretty scathing review of one of his shows in the New York Times. But you said, Mike, you said Aziz is really savvy and smart. Or maybe this was just a private conversation we had. I don't think it was on the podcast. Where you said the fact that he um, saw that criticism and then actually changed his set where he started to address uh, some of the allegations and how he felt about it actually en- ended up winning him favor in the eyes of the critics and probably a lot of the people who are disappointed in him. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. And that's basically the way he opens this set is that before I he gets he was into- always opening it like that, though, Max. Sorry. Because the, the criticism I read is that he opens with a kind of half-hearted apology, and then he transitions into totally dismantling the apology and making fun of uh, the culture in which we ruin people based off uh, an isolated incident. Yeah, I know that there culture. are there's definitely there's definitely been some uh, critics of of this particular special. Um, yeah, no, but I'm saying even beforehand, way back when, but I, when the first when, criticism came out. I, I think, don't think he changed his set all too much. I think he did, though. I think really? I, I, we'd have to go back and read that in New York Times, but I think when he started doing the club, sort of the first few things, they said that he'd almost gone mega or whatever. Like, mm. he'd started sort of like, and all, and he's probably honed it over the last year. Like, you know what I mean? He probably, of course, like any comedian would. Exactly. Yeah. So so I don't know if, like, but it seemed like the angle was in that piece, and again, we're going back like a year, was, was ultimately like, wow, Aziz really like went the other way and that he got screwed over. For the 30 minutes I saw of the opening of this, it didn't feel that way to me. It felt like he sort of like had a sincere, yeah, I mean, as sincere as it perf- like an actor can be, sort of, he kind of addressed it in, in a very um, uncomedic tone that kind of set this weird sort of vibe in the room and then proceeded with his comedy, which is its own sort of, I guess, piece of art. I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know if savvy is the word. It's just like, I, I am fascinated by the idea of like, if he wants to keep working, 
how is he going to approach yeah. it? Well, this, and it was, this is this is my my point is that I think everybody has various levels of like forgiveness and um, sort of patience when it comes to people trying to make comebacks. Given the context of the Z's thing and the way he's chosen to address it, I personally was pretty satisfied with it. I think he was, and the rest of this um, the set was a little more sober than a typical Aziz uh, set. He also, you're right, Shane, that he did address like sort of the issue with outrage culture, but I thought he did it in a really smart and interesting way. It wasn't a like, fuck everybody kind of way. He was just sort of like outlining and identifying and highlighting ideas that I think a lot of people would say, would recognize as true. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then at the very end, Mike, not to spoil it for you, he, he closes in a very somber way. And he said, you know, there was a time where I never thought I'd be able to do this again. And instead of living on my phone or instead of like feeling sorry for myself or anything, I just want to show you guys so much gratitude. And I'm just so thankful that I get to do this. And the fact that you came and bought a ticket and spent time with me means so much to me. And I just thank you so much. Like it was a really, really sincere moment. And I thought it bookended the set really well. And, And to me, that wins him uh, some like really goodwill in in my eyes. I know that, and by the way, Shane, to your point, there's people that will never be satisfied with Aziz doing comedy ever again, or maybe think he should have articulated his apology better. But I thought the whole, the whole thing I thought was, was pretty well done given, given the context of, um, you know, what, what has happened to him. Yeah. If I had a criticism about it and I did enjoy it and I thought everything he was saying about outrage culture and the way kind of society vilifies people, I thought was accurate. It's just he spent a lot of time on it, which mm-hmm. it felt like he was like really doubling down and overcompensating. And then I, I kind of just wanted some normal material at some point And it never really got there beyond the bit about how we only have uh, 60 times left to see our parents or whatever. That was his only real deviation into another topic I, I felt like unless I'm misremembering but no, it just I, seemed like geez he's really hammering down on this like uh, culture and society thing which felt a little hack after a while yeah it, it didn't bother me I, I, I thought like the observations all felt like pretty fresh I, I thought they that. did but it was just too much of the same observation each observation isolated felt awesome and would be good in a, a smaller dose but it was just the same thing said in a different way and then said again and it became predictable and my comedic brain kept knowing exactly where he was going each time mm. because he was setting everything up in this exact same way yeah no f- fair enough um yeah, I thought that Aziz was I like the name of the special is right now and I think the subject matter that he gets into that sure it definitely relates to his personal life. I just thought was very timely uh just given like the state of Twitter and 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 the state of the world right now and the way that we talk to each other and think about having conversations with other people. Uh, hey, I'll, I'll share another question. Do you, I feel like he was sort of uh, imitating uh, Chappelle a lot when he starts doing the quiet voice thing. No one else has really made that observation, but I, the, the latest Chappelle specials, Chappelle does this thing where he talks kind of quiet. And did you know that the thing about that is the thing about this? And Yeah, because there's a school of thought where the quieter you talk, the more people, uh, their ears perk up. And I think Nanette helped that a lot. Of really uh, creating that tension with the, the the being having like sobering thoughts that are serious and not really have any punchline and then transition into comedy. I think he was totally doing that to kind of roller coaster the crowd and control it in a very uh, purposeful way. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well. To that point, I think the reason why I like the special is kind of like when a band does something totally left field where you're like, oh, this album is so definable. Like Beck, it's like um, when he put out uh, Sea Change, it was like, oh, this is his acoustic record where he's clearly depressed and it doesn't sound like anything else like he's ever done. And I just know I'm going to remember this special from Aziz because of the tone and the way it looks and the things he was talking about and the context and the time and place it happened. Uh, more than any of his other specials, because the other ones kind of blend together. So, I, so as like mm-hmm. as a piece of art that is definable and unique, I, I thought it was really impressive. Yeah, 
And, I, and, and do we have any thoughts on, I mean, and this is obviously a broader sort of conversation, but the idea of like people who have had like a fall from grace in society and, and to those people you say that don't want him to, it's for Netflix to give him a platform or they don't want to see someone like him work again uh, in a sense. Like, how do we approach that as a society? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Oh, that's a big question. You know, there was a big New Yorker article, not to name drop Shane. A New Yorker is a really like highly intellectual uh, <laughs> magazine. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, uh, no, I've read that yesterday. <laughs> well, um, speaking of that, Aziz had a really funny bit in his thing that re- I related to a little bit too much, where he talks about how, like all these like woke liberal people will be like they'll read one article and then they'll literally go at you relentlessly with like facts and like oh of things. course. And, and I was like, oh fuck, I'm like I've been I've, I've been that guy too. Well, Shane. everybody's yeah. That guy. Oh my god, yeah. I'm just like and so I laughed really hard at that point because I was like, yeah, he's he's nailed that. But anyway, Max, go on. No, no, you're right. right. He's like, you know who's you know what's not going to solve the world's problems? White guys talking at brunch about an yes! article they just re- re- read. Yeah, <laughs> so fucking good. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, but Jane Mayer, who's like a prolific New Yorker investigative reporter, she just did a long piece on Al Franken and his fall from grace. I read that. Oh, and w- I read that. Wasn't that a good piece? It was fascinating as hell, and it was it, it was well reported. Yeah, well researched. reported, and it kind of reminded me in a weird way of the Aziz situation. And I just and you should read listeners read that New Yorker piece by Jane, Jane Mayer about Al Franken, but it just reminded me that like every sort of crime or misdeed is different, and context is really important, and that not all sins should be punished in the same way, and. And there's a lot of work to be done. I don't know. There's just, you just got to throw these vague ideas. But it's all to say that I don't have a real solution. Just that everything should be taken in its own context, I suppose. And yeah. it's, a, it's a living, moving thing that I think us as a society are figuring out as we go. This is We're in a weird new era when it comes to this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like we figured out how to do other crimes. Like, you know, in some places, if you stole something, they used to chop your hand off, which that, that might have been a little extreme. So we've modified that. But when it comes to things of a sexual nature, right now it's just like, let's ruin their career. Let, they're out of here for however long it takes till society can figure it out. Well, and it- I, think, uh, I think Aziz took a big step here in making a change, kind of hopefully in the, the right direction of knowing how to police this stuff. Because he, he does spend a long time on it, which kind of ruined the comedy for it. But I think as a as a statement to really hammer it home to people on how to think of these things, I do think it really was a giant leap forward. And anyone who's been accused of this, it's probably their favorite special right now. Sure. Uh, yeah, well, anyway, listeners, let us know uh, what you think uh, of the Aziz special. We're kind of curious to know where, where you land on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so does that wrap us on Aziz? Yeah. And then our, for a third topic, again, uh, based on our, our man Colin Drake's suggestion, we're throwing it out to uh, Shane for a surprise third topic. Well, this is a, a good transition because it is kind of in the world of weird crimes that some people think uh, people are taking too seriously and they don't know how to really police it. And I'm talking about people who lick food and, oh, get, and yeah. get, get caught. There's a clip of a a woman who licked uh, uh, the top of an ice cream, like a ice cream uh, bin. Yep. What's that called? Like a tub, a tub of ice tub cream? A tub of ice cream. And yeah. you open the lid, she licked the top. She and opened the lid. the lid. It was one of those places that they don't put that uh, thin layer of cellophane sure. over to protect it. So anyway, she opens it, licks it, puts it back in the freezer. Clip goes viral. Whoa. Now she's facing 20 years in prison. <laughs> yeah. They, the gov- is, is it was in a state, right? The governor's like really coming down hard or something? Yeah. So Ariana Grande did this as well with the That's donuts. what I was going to bring up. Yeah. And so uh, a couple of years ago, it was 2015, Ariana Grande and her friends are at a donut shop and she starts saying how she hates America and starts licking donuts. And it's kind of like a shocking thing and there was a lot of outrage, but she was never facing any jail time or yeah. anything like that. So do you think so when it comes to licking pastries, celebrities are treated better than a normal person <laughs> what else is there that's, that's not, yeah I think when it comes to anything <laughs> celebrities are treated better than civilians 100% whether that is a a crime or a, a, a lineup in a restaurant or anything like it's like life is obviously better for rich and famous people in a lot of ways I'm sure it's not as good in some other ways. And and how gross is this? So that's a great question uh, my initial thought again we never know what you're going to bring up is that Listen, like somebody licking your food and the, you know, we, 
there is so much faith when it comes to the service industry that just the whole thing works and that people are inherently good and they're not fucking with your food and all that stuff. And I would bet that 99.9% of the time that is the case. Now, in the cases where people are fucking with your food, like licking it is juvenile. Is it a health uh, concern? I'm sure someone could argue that it, it, it could be on some level. Uh, maybe I'm dismissing the real health ramifications, but I don't think it's, you know, we sit on, like, listen. I think that it should be some sort of fine and like a, like a speeding ticket. I do not think people should, I, I, my first instinct is it should be like a, uh, a, a really finable offense, but something really debilitating, like maybe find somebody $5,000 for it and they would think twice about doing it. Putting someone in jail for like licking a, a, a food in a prank sort of way, I don't know. I don't know, man. That, that seems tough. That being said, if somebody were to like do something to your food that could actually make you really sick, like put x lax in your soup, let's say, yeah, that's assault, I, I think. See, I level. think the x lax is more of a prank right? and the uh, licking the thing was more of a dare. Right. So my, my wife and I were getting in a huge debate over pranks and dares last <laughs> night, and I know that you and I aren't going to. But no, my attitude is that I, I, I kind of fall. I lean, lean towards you, uh, Mike, on this. In that, like putting someone in jail. Are you ever going to lean towards me, uh, Max? <laughs> Anytime someone says I lean towards, like like Eric always does, is I tend to lean towards Mike. Like lean towards me once. It's okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, what I was going to say, Shane, is Sorry. that I th- would add, do you know how sex offenders have to register with the, like, the local police department when they move into a new neighborhood yes. to let the neighbors know that they're a sex offender? I think something like that needs to happen with liquors. I think people have to, they have to wear something that identifies them as antisocial and that they should be shamed, publicly shamed. Let's shame them. Let's shame them to, to a degree. Like maybe for like in the next two years, you have to wear like, uh, you know, a red wristband that indicates that you're a liquor and, uh, that this is something that you know people should know about you, and it should be attached to your name for any other employment future opportunity. Yeah. Like when your name, if they, if there should be a database where like people can check, like you know, background check on say like potential food industry workers, that should follow you. Like you should no longer be allowed <laughs> to walk into any restaurant and fucking serve. You should never be able to handle another person's food again if you are a liquor, and they should be shamed. Well, they should have it. to register and, and, in a database and, and pay a fine. And it doesn't have to last for your whole life. I'm just saying for like two years or like six months or a year, something, some something to discourage people how do you guys react if you find a hair in your food i'm always fascinated by uh, I want people's to, reaction i want to vomit and i can't finish the food wow max it doesn't bother me too i mean it's annoying but it doesn't bother me too. i don't care either yeah i know yeah. my danica's the same way like a lot of people are i, I don't know why it bothers me so much mm-hmm. i just it really it's a visceral thing yeah, for right. you it is it is it's one of those weird things what I if have. it's your hair uh it still grosses me out really your yeah. own even hair? your own yeah. hair wow wow well, that was my topic for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, don't lick food. Come on. Like, it's fucking gross. And you are a social uh, degenerate if that is something that you would do. And, and this includes fucking Ariana Grande. Like, seriously. Mm-hmm. Oh, actually, here's mm-hmm. my question. Do you guys think, I mean, I guess Shane, uh, Max already said he feels like they should be shamed, not put in jail. Uh, do you think that jail time should be on the table or assault or whatever or some sort of criminal uh, record should follow a liquor? I tend to lean with you on this one, Mike. Uh, <laughs> I, and I do. <laughs> I'm not just saying that. <laughs> Mike on Much can be found on Twitter and Instagram at Mike on Much. You can subscribe to the show on any platform that has podcasts. Uh, Spotify, do it.